You ready to do this, Delvin? I'm ready, Spence. Punch it, Chewy. Welcome, super friends, to the Fortress of Nerditude podcast, a safe place to talk about all things in nerd and pop culture. I'm Spencer Stapleton, and my co-pilot tonight is Delvin Cox. We're two nerds that just refuse to grow up. Thank you for joining us. This is episode 124. We release every Thursday morning. You can find us on our website, fortednerd.com. We have links to iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are available. Stop by and relax a while. If you like what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and get us automatically each and every week in your ear holes. Delvin Cox, my man, it is so good to have you here in the Fortress and Nerded 2 tonight. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, brother. How you doing, man? I am doing good. I got a lot of energy tonight. That's a good thing. That's definitely a good thing. I haven't had any sugar in a while, so I don't know where this energy is coming from. Maybe pure adrenaline? Drugs. (laughs) Well, I, I mean... This is a family show, and uh, I haven't had an aspirin or Tylenol in a while, so I don't, I don't know. But Ch- children's so de- Tylenol. <laughs> yeah, children's Tylenol. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you about a little children's Tylenol here in a minute. But before we get to that, Delvin, what is going on with you? What is new in your life? What's happening on your podcast? Like, what is going on down there in uh, Miami? I am getting old. That's the first and foremost. <laughs> I just had my 39th birthday, I want to say last week. Well, congratulations. Happy birthday. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. You know, just growing old. And I heard the one thing you don't want to hear when you turn 39 years old, and that's your hair is thinning. Like, oh, mm. God, no, I don't want to hear Well, that. I mean, come on. Like, I, I heard that at 16, so I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but you look good with bald hair. <laughs> I do make this look good. That yeah. is true. <laughs> so you're 39. I turned 40 like a month ago, man. We are not old. Yeah. Nah, not old. Like, I'm looking at it this way. I'm barely approaching the halfway point in my life. I got another 10 years before I hit halfway. That's a good way to look at it. I figure with modern science and my determination to live as long as I possibly can, I'm going to hit 100. That's what I'm aiming for. I'm See? aiming for 100, maybe 200. <laughs> yeah, man, you're not even halfway there yet. You're still young. If I can find the Lazarus pit. <laughs> I'm taking whatever I can to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's new with the Delvin Cox experience? What's been going on there lately? Man, it's been a wild ride, man. It's just been fantastic. Just recording different episodes with different people, different experiences, getting more in- intricate interviews with people about different things, social issues, things like that. It's been fantastic. I can't complain one bit. And I noticed you got the background behind you. That's new too since the last time we recorded together. Yeah, I, I like it. The cool set, like a like a news broadcast or something like that. <laughs> right. This breaking on the Delvin Cox experience. This just in. <laughs> but no, nah, I like I like it, man. It's a it's a clue to that. Big yeah. things coming up soon. So nice, that nice. Plays I a like part into it. I like hearing that. I like hearing that. Uh, have you, what, so what's new? Like, are you, are you watching stuff, reading stuff, playing stuff? Like what's new in your world? Like media wise? I'm doing all three. Yeah. Yeah. I'm playing right now, which is going to be interesting for you to hear. I bought, you ever heard of the game judgment? It's going uh, on PS4. Yeah. Sounds familiar. It's kind of like a Yakuza spinoff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It hasn't come out in the United States yet, but I Ooh. bought the Japanese version of it. You got a bootleg is what you're saying. No, I actually bought the actual Japanese version. I ordered it from oh, okay. PlayAsia. And I'm playing it now. Because I love the Yakuza games. And um, I was when I bought, when I ordered it, I was a little worried because the game would had a problem where one of the actors got arrested. Uh-oh. He got arrested. And they were talking about, well, he's, I think he's one of the main characters. They were talking about actually like shelving the game, the U.S. release of the game oh. because of it. And I was like, ooh, ah. I'm in the, like, at, at right, as of right now, the Japanese version of the game is selling for like $150, $200 because they're essentially taking the actor out of the game. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, they're taking now, him I'm, out I'm, of the game. So, so you're him. saying you got a copy before the price went sky high, right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that much no, more. no games were two hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, I got it for the price went high because I wanted to play it. I was worried, like I don't want to play this. I don't want it not to come out here or get heavily delayed. Right. So I said, right. let me just order it, and I like it so far. It's, I want to say it's more, it's more Yakuza. If you ever played the Yakuza games, they're beat 'em up brawlers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With an interesting story behind it, it's more like more or less that, but it's mm. a little bit more. Deep. I like it a lot so far nice nice all right so you're playing this yakuza kind of spin-off japan japanese spin-off yeah. uh, that hasn't hit the states here i like that man it sounds like you know you're you're a world traveler you know getting the <laughs> getting the stuff right from japan what have you what have you been watching what have you been reading i'm reading this i don't even know the name of it it's a walking dead book that i found in the dollar store which is crazy to think of it's like a big walking dead novel that apparently came out not too long ago and it's interesting so far. And it was cool. like it was, it was in a dollar store. It was in a Dollar Tree, because Dollar Tree has this section where they have all these books for a yeah, dollar. Because yeah. I guess apparently people don't read books anymore, so they have a whole bunch of books in there for a dollar, like a lot of wrestling books and stuff. Like Chris Jericho's book was in there for a dollar, hmm. and um, Barack Obama's book was in there for a dollar. So I just usually go over there, look at some books, pick up a man, book. The, the pre the former president only can get a dollar now. <laughs> yes, man. It's crazy to think about it, but yeah. It's a good thing he got that like $7 million advance on his book before he took office then, I guess. <laughs> Definitely. Because he he's only but, getting a buck a piece now. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I'm enjoying it, but I can't think of the name of it. I'll, I'll message you when I get the name of it, but it's a, a right. good one. Robert Kirkman, Walking Dead book, and it's, huh. it's really good so far. Cool, cool. What have you been watching? Catching up on movies, mostly. I watched... This past week, I went to go see Shazam. Yes. Which I enjoyed. Good, good. I also watched Aquaman a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago. Which what wasn't do you think that of that? Bad. I didn't think it was that bad. I know some people... I thought Aquaman was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a fun movie. Yeah, like... Uh, so here's the thing. I know some people were, like, expecting Aquaman to be, like, this, you know, like, tour de force performance. I was like, okay, it's Jason Momoa. You're not... He's not Lawrence Olivier. You're not going to get, you know this massive performance, you know, he's not Joaquin Phoenix, but what he does do is he plays that kind of role, that Arthur role so well, it's kind of like, you know, you can relate to the guy. Yeah, it felt like, because for those who don't know, James Wan directed it, who makes the Fast and right. Furious movies, so it felt like a superhero version of the Fast and Furious movies, which yeah. fits perfectly. Yeah, it's a fun movie, man. It, it's a sit down with a bucket of popcorn and enjoy yourself. Don't worry about it being a thinker. Let's just watch sharks and crabs fight each other. Yeah, pretty much. I like I said, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a very fun movie to watch. I rec I recommend people see it, watch it. Yeah, I, I actually bought it. I bought I the too. digital version. Yep, I'm, because I was like, I'll watch this again a few times, and when my kids get old enough, they can watch it. Yeah, I bought it that so, too. So let's talk Shazam, man. You saw Shazam. What did you think of Shazam? I think it's really good. I think I'm surprised how good it is, and I'm. I don't want to get like I said. I don't want to get too much into spoilers with it, but there are a few surprises in it that I didn't expect. Maybe yeah. it's because I didn't watch all of it. I think I watched one trailer, and I was talking to Joey Craig from the Skyward Cast, another podcast I do about it. And he was like, "Oh, that was in the trailer." I'm like, I don't remember seeing none of this stuff in the trailer. But it's yeah. a, the movie. It's fun. Yes, I saw it two weeks ago on a sneak preview. And I came out of there saying, like, I'm not going to say anything because I know it hasn't hit, you know, uh, wide uh, for theaters. But I went, man, it's a fun movie and it's funny. But there's a really, a really kind of great, like, family dynamic story kind of underneath. It's got a lot of heart to it. Yes. And for me, like, mixing all those elements could sound like it could be a recipe for, like, hey, you know, the one story is going to get trampled on versus the other. And I came out of there going, man, this is this is a great movie. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's not going to have the hype of, like, Avengers Endgame is going to have. It's not going to pull in that kind of money. It's not going to pull in the money like Captain Marvel pulls in. But, I mean, for what it is, it's just a good, solid, fun movie that you can watch with your family. And it made... Really good money. It's opening weekend, something like a hundred and fifty-five million dollars. 
Yeah, and I think it would do. It will continue to do good until Endgame comes out because I don't think there's any other thing else big coming out before nope. that. I think it's going to continue to make a lot of money, and I'm already hearing rumors that a uh, Shazam two has already been greenlit. That's good. That's so really I'm good. I'm happy about that. I mean, gosh, DC needs some wins. I mean, I know Aquaman was a big uh, financial success for DC. Wonder Woman was a big financial and critical success for DC. I like that DC is getting a kind of a f- more fun family, I say family ish movie. Yes. That's going to be a, a success for them as well. Like they need wins in the worst possible way. And so I, I'm glad. I like when DC wins. I think people want to put Mount Marvel against DC all the time, but in the grand scheme of things, when both companies do great, we win from it. Right. I, I, I don't see, I don't see Mar. I mean, I, I'm sure DC looks at Marvel and says like, we want to compete. I mean, obviously you kind of get that sense with, Hey, they rushed into a justice league movie before they established other characters because they were trying to get there. And so you get some of that, but I don't think we need to as fans, right? As fans, I don't think we need to be comparing the two and saying like, you've got to pick one or the other, or it's got to be contentious. I have seen a lot of people, you know, back and forth, just jawing at each other, getting all negative. It's like, man, just enjoy it for what it is. Marvel does fun stuff. DC can do fun stuff when they, you know, kind of get their act together. Uh, Let's just enjoy it for what it is. I I always say go back to uh I don't watch a lot of wrestling now, but in the 90s when WCW and WWF or WWE uh were competing against each other, man, that was some of the best wrestling you could see at the time because each show was trying to one up each other and there was real competition. So let's just enjoy some healthy competition and great movie making and great storytelling. And at the end of the day, everyone wins. That's all I'm saying. I completely agree with that, especially with the wrestling part. (laughs) I was a huge WCW fan. And Uh, WWE for that matter. Yeah. Man, I I watched wrestling probably up until like the late 90s. And then I pretty much took a hiatus for a couple of years. Watched a little bit in the early mid 2000s. And then... And then I haven't seen any since. I know, I know, like my feed's blowing up right now because I guess WrestleMania was last night. But yes. yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't know any of it. I don't watch it, any of it anymore. And, you know, it's kind of like cartoons. I don't watch a lot of cartoons anymore either. And that's okay. Yeah. Not hating, not hating on cartoons or not hating on wrestling. Just, you know, I got other things to do now. And yeah. let's be honest, you're a dad, I'm a dad. You only have so many hours in a day. You got to pick your thing, right? That is very true. You got to pick it. Especially when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit what's going on with me, Delvin. So I just finished uh, today my Kingdom Hearts playthrough. Uh, I decided to go back and replay the 1.5 uh, remaster with my kids and my wife watching because they've never seen it before. I played the game originally when it came out in like 2002 and I played it again in like 2004 maybe. And then again, maybe like in 2006 and then I haven't touched it in easily like 13 years. Okay. I got to ask this so, question. Yeah. How much of the plot did you understand while you were playing it? Oh, I understood the plot perfectly because I really remembered the game because I really loved it uh, from the first get go. Um, and I kind of knew where all the big story beats were coming up. Um, but here's the thing I did do. I decided that I'm going to go for the platinum in the game. Oh, no. <laughs> which means a few things. One, you have to play it on the hardest difficulty to get the other difficulties to stack. I'm trying to play it through in a, the least amount of you know repeat plays, which you can do it in two if you do it right. Um, I played on the hardest. I had to synthesize everything in the game. I had to do all the extra mini bosses and hidden bosses, which they've added one to the game uh, on the remaster uh, that kind of ties into the second game. I also had to go and go and collect a bunch more materials that were not in the first game that they've added in the remaster, which took a little while because one of them was just freaking annoying. Um, I put in probably close to about 60 hours of real play time to complete it. Now you also have to do a speed run. You have to beat the game in under 15 hours. 
but there's a glitch. If you let the timer run over 100 hours, it resets. So if you either beat it in the first 15 hours of gameplay or between 100 and 115 hours of gameplay, you get the speed run. So, of course, I since I was doing the big collecting run this go round, I just let the timer run. Got to like 100 hours and 12 minutes and then I beat the game. So on the official thing, it says I beat the game in 12 minutes. Hey, <laughs> uh, to get that trophy. Now I've started again tonight replaying the game. Like literally I finished it this evening and then I've restarted again because the last two trophies I need to get the platinum is I have to play the game without changing any of my equipment, which means the starting equipment you get at the very beginning of the game, you have to beat the game with. That's going to be a little challenging. The second thing is I cannot use any continues. So if I die, I have to load back to my last save point, which means I've just got to constantly be hitting save points and saving every opportunity I get so I don't lose a bunch if if I die. I don't have to do those on a harder difficulty, so I've got it set to easy, and I'm just trying to blow through the game. I'm going to skip all the optional worlds. I'm not collecting anything. I'm not synthesizing anything. No mini bosses. It's literally... I'm trying to speed run this game just to get these last two trophies and then get the platinum. Why I chose to do an action RPG that's going to require multiple playthroughs when you can easily drop 60 to 80 to 100 hours on a playthrough. Oh, I don't know why, but I love the game. So yeah, now, that's a testament to how much you love that game. Yeah. You said I'm getting the platinum and Kingdom Hearts. I'm like, oh. No, yeah, thank you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not it's not a not not an easy one. It's not it's not incredibly difficult, but it just requires some time. Um, I was home with sick kids this weekend. Um, Jackson, my youngest, got the flu, and so that's you know always lots of fun because you don't sleep and you're dealing with you know a sick kid who's whiny. And like today, I came home middle of the day. Uh, to take over the kind of the afternoon shift. My wife did the morning shift because we were keeping him from going back to daycare today. And like at lunchtime, I was like, hey, buddy, you know, he's holding down food. But I asked him, I'm like, buddy, are you really hungry? No, he says. I said, okay, well, do you want anything? He's like, I just want an orange. He ate half an orange. That's all he had for lunch. I was like, dude, you got to eat something. But he just, you know, you know how it is when you're sick. Like you just don't want to eat. Yeah. But apparently half an orange is enough for a, you know, almost five-year-old. Yeah, it figure. always sucks when the little ones are, the minds are already big, 11 and 13. But I remember when they used to get sick and they just had this little puppy dog eyes and yep. you almost feel helpless. <laughs> like When they look at you and they say, Daddy, can you please just carry me upstairs? You're like, oh, dude, come on. You're yeah. killing me. Like, don't look at me like that because now I have to. Like, you just, you can't say no, right? Yeah. Especially when they're sick. Um, all right. So here's something I'm watching that, that I I said I wasn't going to. And I, maybe it's because I'm 40 and I'm, you know, trying to go back on things and, you know, give some things a second uh, opinion. I decided to start watching Cobra Kai, the, uh, the show that follows uh, Johnny Lawrence and Daniel LaRusso after the events of uh, The Karate Kid, which is like my favorite 80s movie of all time. Uh, well, maybe that in Ghostbusters. Um, I've watched the first two episodes of the show. Man, I'm really enjoying it. I was going to say that I I enjoyed that's the first season. I didn't I didn't think I was going to. I just I didn't like the idea of like, hey, here's something that was, in my opinion, a pretty perfect kind of 80s movie. Let's kind of rehash it or find a way to kind of reboot it but make it in today now. Also, it's only going to be on YouTube Red, so it's behind the YouTube paywall. Uh, But uh, I decided that uh, I was going to give it a go. And so far, two episodes in, I'm pleasantly surprised. They did a great job in the way they tell that story in terms of there's not necessarily a good guy or a bad guy. It's kind of just shades of gray. Yeah. Even Even with Daniel. It's more like, it's kind of how you would see their future being. Right. Which I think is good storytelling because you have to like look out and see like, how would this person, like how would this person's life be 20 years, 30 years down the road after the events of, you know, of the movie in 1984. 
And the funny thing is, like, they definitely give Johnny Lawrence that, you know, I peaked in high school kind of vibe. Like, you know, that was like the peak of like his life, right? Yes. And we all know those kind of guys. Guys that peaked in high school, they were the kind of the top of the food chain, and then they really didn't go anywhere. And he's like, you know, starts off and he's like a handyman, fixing wiring and hanging TVs in people's homes, driving his old Firebird. I mean, you know, that's you know, kind of a POS at this point. And then Daniel Larusso, who's obviously successful in business, but you can still see the, you know, he he still is that kind of insecure, nerdy kid that got the crap kicked out of him, even at this point in his life. And when he sees kind of the, what I'll say, kind of the ghost of the past, it affects him and it, and it you know, it, you know, kind of gets him a little bit off his game. I think that's perfect because I think that's where these people really would be in life. Yeah. And it's also cool that I like the fact that it affects him not only because he sees Johnny Lawrence, but he doesn't have that safety blanket that he had a, a, with Mr. Miyagi. Right. Yes. Yes, man, we're getting deep on this Cobra Kai thing. I, I loved uh, it. I watched it when it first came out, and I'm like, this is actually incredible. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to watching the next episode uh, tonight after we're done recording as kind of a way to kind of cool down after the podcast and, you know, get some sleep. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to keep going. So, man, that's kind of been my week. I mean, it's been work and kind of all the usual stuff, but uh, playing some video games, dealing with sick kids, starting a new show, and then, of course... Coming up this weekend is that big old Game of Thrones, so uh, you know that's going to be a, a hot topic around here for the next little while. It's the last oh, season, so I love anyway. Game of Thrones. I love the direction it's going into now into the final season, so I'm excited. I'm excited too. I don't, there is a little part of me though that's a little hesitant, only because even though I know we're past where we are in the books. The thing is, is that I know that George R. R. Martin, the, the author of the Song of Ice and Fire book series that this is based on, he said that, uh, that the guys, the showrunners, uh, over at HBO, uh, sat down, talked with him, and they kind of have the broad strokes of how the books are going to end. So I know that there's a really good chance that the last two books are going to have some major spoilers in this season. And I'll still read the books, and I know I will, but it's just this new territory, and the show's going to end. And unless George R. R. Martin does a big, hard left turn in his book series, I kind of feel like we're going to be getting the preview of like how the book is going to end. I, th- I think he is going to do kind of some type of turn with it. Because the the series doesn't follow the books to the T. Right. Then- I mean, it does kind of close in the first few seasons. Yes. But then... Then once we get to, uh, spoiler alert, this is like from like season five. So, uh, if you're not caught up, yeah, sorry. When Jon Snow gets killed, that's where we end on the last book. Then obviously things happen. We had like two other seasons and, you know, hey, Jon Snow's back, which is what fans have been speculating in the books for the long time. But so in the books currently, Jon Snow is dead in the movies. He's still, or in the TV show and movies. A similar thing, right? Uh, in the in the TV show, he's very much a integral part of the ongoing story. So, I can see that happening in the books. I think but it has to. It, yeah, almost at this point, it has to happen. But I can see him making s- certain changes, so you get a different experience from the book as you do the show. Yeah, yeah I hope so. Anyway, uh, yeah. Big big stuff on the horizon. Big stuff on the horizon here. Uh, what do you say, Delvin? Should we uh, should we move into Rebel Intelligence? I am definitely down to move into Rebel Intelligence. But the first thing we got to do, we got to kill some Bothans to do that. Rest in peace, Bothans. I always have to let you know, many Bothans died to bring us this information. Rest in peace, you Bothans. All right, Delvin, we are into Rebel Intelligence. We have sufficed our uh, sacrifice of Bothans upon the altar of Rebel Intelligence. What do you have for me this week? Apparently, they announced Edra's album was going to be playing Deadshot, but then they changed it, and now he's 
not going to be playing Deadshot, but another character in James Gunn's Suicide Squad movie. Yeah, I heard this. So, first of all, I love Idris Elba. You can put him in any movie and I'm okay. Yeah, I love Idris like, Elba. I, one of my favorite amazing. shows is Luther. See, I, I have not seen that one. It's That's excellent. one I have. But see, I was introduced to him when he was Stricker Bell in The Wire. Yeah. And the ooh, awesome. ooh, man, I love that show. Um, so yeah, I, I was kind of curious about this whole thing, right? So they announced that he's going to be playing Deadshot, and then Originally. they quickly quickly pull it back, right? They quickly pull it back and say, no, 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 he's playing someone else. And I think the reason for that is that Will Smith didn't say he doesn't want to play Deadshot anymore. It wasn't like creative differences. I think he just couldn't commit to the uh, the filming of the new Suicide Squad because it conflicted with something else he had. Bad Boys 3, if I'm correct. Yeah. Because he's filming Bad Boys 3 now, and I think... It's gonna. I think they're gonna start filming Suicide Squad like really soon, if right? Correct. Really, really soon. So, I like that. I like that DC's kind of leaving the door open so that they potentially could bring Will Smith back as Deadshot. Um, I liked his character as Deadshot in the first Suicide Squad. It probably was one of the better characters. I mean, him and Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. We're probably like the only two really good characters in that movie. I think that's why they're leaving that door open for him to come back because he was him and Margot Robbie were kind of the stars of that movie. And I, right. I don't think they just want to like, okay, let's just put Edges out in that place because why just have, why replace Will Smith where you can ha- end up having a situation where you can have Will Smith and Edges Alba in the same movie. Right. I mean, if I'm, if I'm putting money down, and I've got a chance to get both Idris Elba and Will Smith. I'm gonna drop that extra change and make that happen. Yeah, I'm like just, I'm just saying. Might not be Suicide Squad two, but if they play their cards right, Suicide Squad three can have. Right. Yeah, man. I like it. Uh, so you're you're all caught up on Game of Thrones, right? Yes. Okay. So let me ask you this: If you had a chance to to go and like experience a kind of like a let's say like have you ever been to universal harry potter yes i have and okay it's crazy because i never watched any of the harry potter movies really yes I, and I, so, I went so and I, jo- I enjoyed it your kids got you to go is what you're saying right they haven't seen it either <laughs> they haven't seen it either yeah we, we went to universal one year and you know how they have like the different parts of Universal. We just wandered in uh, Harry Potter land. They were like, hey, that ride looks cool. Let's get on. I was like, okay. It, it was fun. It, Harry Potter land looks awesome, by the way, in Universal Studios. Oh, it's it's amazing looking. Let me ask you a question. If you could go to some place that looked reminiscent of Harry Potter, however, it was Game of Thrones themed, is that something you would pay money to go do? As long as I'm not going to get murdered there, <laughs> I would gladly go. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I I agree. Um, so something that's really kind of interesting is right outside of Belfast in one of the studios where a lot of Game of Thrones has been filmed, HBO is currently turning one of their big studios into, as, I, as I, I'm reading here, a 110,000 square foot museum that they're going to have this immersive experience. It's going to be a big Game of Thrones kind of land. Uh, it's going to have... They said stuff like costumes and weapons and props. They're going to show how, you know, some of the things were made. You're going to be able to sit on the actual Iron Throne that was used in filming and take photos. Uh, it's, it's this whole thing. I mean, it's going to have set pieces. They're talking about making it look like King's Landing. They're going to have other places look like Dragonstone, the wall. Um, they're saying that it's going to open in spring of 2020. Now, they're saying that it's going to stay in the U S or it's going to stay over in Belfast. There's no current plans to bring it to the U S would you be willing to fly to Ireland to go and visit something like this? I would, but the only problem I see what it is game of Thrones. And this is not to be offensive anyway to anybody, but it's such a niche thing. Like you can't take your kids to, Hey, let's go see game of Thrones. land, Right. 
hey, uh, you want to see how Ramsey Bolton made the sausage? No, you're not going <laughs> to take a small kid to do that. No. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's kind of one of those things that you have to like. It's something that you probably would go with your boys to go go hang out at. Right. Right. When they're older, yes, definitely. Yes. Uh, so here's my thinking. Like, I look at something like this and I say, if I was going to go like on a Europe trip, right? Like I was going to go and maybe go to Ireland and maybe like London and, you know, somewhere in England and then maybe go, you know, somewhere on the kind of the main continent of Europe, you know, maybe go to Germany or I don't know, Sweden, Norway, somewhere. If I was going to do kind of a big trip, I probably would make sure that I you go to Ireland, kiss the Blarney Stone, you know, do some stuff in Dublin and then go to Belfast and see this. Like I would, I would include it on an itinerary of a bigger trip, but I don't know if I would fly just there just for this one thing. Cause yeah. that would be like a day maybe, right? Yeah, probably. Like, well, and like, like, like I was saying before, you can't take your whole family there. Right. Yeah. I can't take little kids and be like, Hey, this is how they killed everyone at King's Landing. Cause they're not going to, you know, they're, they're not going to care. Plus, technically, it does say that it's a museum. And we took our kids to the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco like uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago. And the kids weren't, they weren't having it. I mean, they're, they're small. I mean, Charlie's six now and Jackson's about ready to turn five. So a year ago, they were like five and, you know, almost four. They just, you know... Yeah, they just weren't having any of it. They're like, this, you know, they're like, this isn't Disneyland. I'm like, yeah, it's a museum. They don't understand that, you know, what that is. So, and I can tell you uh, right now, my wife would not be having it at all. No, <laughs> not even no. close. It's like, no, we're not going to that. <laughs> you could probably nice. go, but right. the rest of us you're are not on, going. You're on your own. We're going to stay here at this pub or, you know, we're going to go see, you know, something, right? Yeah, you're off on your own, honey. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Uh, I like it. I like the idea. Spring 2020, if you're going to be in the Belfast area, super friends, I'm just saying, it's there. Get it. All right, Delvin, what do you got next for us? Okay. Let me ask you this question. What did you think of The Last Jedi? That's a very loaded question. I've talked about it a lot, and I know. I'm going to say that it was an okay movie. It had some it had some good parts. It had some things that I enjoyed. I hated the treatment of Luke Skywalker and his character. I think it was way out of character for who he is. Also, my caveat to that is also saying that I've read almost every book that's in the old uh, extended universe that's now considered legends and not canon. And it used to be canon for like, you know, a few decades. So... I feel I have a really good sense of who Luke Skywalker is, and I felt like that movie did not capture that character at all, which Luke Skywalker's kind of like the main guy in uh, the Star Wars series, so that was rough. That was rough. Why do you ask? So how would you feel if I were to tell you that Ryan Johnson is okay with Star Wars Episode Nine retconning The Last Jedi? Is it that he's okay with it like he actually is okay with it or is it more he just thinks that jj is going to do it and so he's just saying that he's okay because it's inevitably gonna happen i think he's just saying that it's okay <laughs> because jj is gonna make some edits <laughs> JJ Cause, is gonna because i mean right you, you got to look at it if you're the director of a film you've you've taken a, a direction you wanted to do something creative with it you put your spin on it like you're saying that hey this is what it is so if someone else is going to come in on the next movie and be like, hey, all those things that just happened, ha, 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 just kidding. How do you not take that a little personal? Well, it's kind of weird because it. I guess I'm going to talk. Let's talk about it since this is a, a, a subject. Um, the Last Jedi, as opposed to The Force Awakens, feels like a, almost a different franchise in terms of how it yeah. changes the scope of the story so much. Yeah, th there is that. I mean, the knock against The Force Awakens, and there's not a lot, but it was just a retelling of A New Hope. Yeah. I mean, they they upped the the size of the Death Star and made it, you know, the Star Killer, and they, you know, they it was just kind of, you know, hey, instead of having, you know, Darth Vader, we've got Kylo Ren. I mean, just it literally was kind of a retelling of of A New Hope. 
it was still an amazing movie, but they rebooted it in a way to bring in a lot of new people that weren't around in 1977. Yeah. Last Jedi, though, I think you're right, Delvin, that it just takes a hard left turn. It changes some characters. There was like plot threads to me that like just didn't make any sense. Like, why go to the floating freaking casino? Why meet with the slicer who they don't end up like getting on their side, who just betrays them? Like that whole plot seemed to kind of like go nowhere just to end in the exact same place that they could have like cut that out and it would have been in the exact same place to begin with. Um, yeah. And then like the whole, like the notion of you don't have to be a Skywalker to have the ability to control the force. And they felt like that thematically was something that they really needed to like hammer home. But it's like, Hey, if you've seen the prequels, you know that there used to be like thousands of freaking Jedi running around in the galaxy years before the Skywalker clan ever came about. The movies we grew up with just happened to focus on one particular family that had the Force or was Force-sensitive or whatever. Because, you know, you can't tell a story that focuses on a thousand people. You have to have a protagonist and you have to have a few characters that people care about. Yeah, and And there's so many points to add on to that. that So many seeds that were dropped in The Force Awakens that just wasn't answered in The Last Jedi at all or even mentioned. And then you add on the fact that they gave the Force Awakens gave you your central characters. You're like, okay, yep. Finn, Ray, Kylo Ren, and Poe Dameron. Those yep. are your that's your generation right there. These are your guys. And the Last Jedi was like, nah, we're just gonna talk about Ray and Kylo Ren, and everybody else's story is secondary, yeah. not really that important. Yeah, or we're gonna talk about Ray, Kylo Ren, and we're gonna talk about Luke. And it, and it was like, okay, great, but uh. You know, what's Poe Dameron doing? Do we really care? Oh, he defied some orders? Okay, great, whatever. He's on the ship the whole time. He's on the ship the whole movie. Yeah. Not being Poe Dameron. Finn went to a casino and nothing happened and, oh, okay, great. Uh, Yeah. So, I don't know, man. You really think J.J.'s going to go and and, uh, light up The Last Jedi and, and change a lot? Yeah, I think he's going because there's a lot of things that wasn't answered in the in the last Jedi that he's going to have to kind of answer for. Like one of the things that kind of bothered me was the whole scene where Ray got her lightsaber, and you clearly hear Obi Wan talking to her. Right, and then yeah. they just don't mention it at all in the last Jedi. I'm like, so here's the thing though with J J Abrams, he does like to drop little clues and little nuggets. And then he moves on to another project and he leaves those for other people to follow up. Like famously, he did that with Alias. He did that with Lost. Um, so that doesn't surprise me that he did it. But I just, uh, I didn't care that Ryan Johnson like just basically ignored it or yes. like, you know, said, ah, like that's a red herring. Just, ign- you know, we're moving past it. Yeah, that's so. what it, that's what it felt like. It felt like Ryan, to, to my opinion, at least. It felt like Ryan Johnson would have been suited for his own Star Wars movie. Which they've talked about him doing, and I think that would have been better. Anyway, we I've talked about this, you know, a ton. It's it's not my Star hashtag not my Star Wars movie. Um it's still it's still an okay movie. I mean, if yeah, it's, it's if it's, it's if it's horrible. on its own, no, it's not a horrible movie. Yeah. And if this was on its own and it wasn't part of some big massive franchise that we all knew and loved, this would be a great movie on its own, but it's not on its own, and that's the problem. And so it's tough. It's tough to be a director to come in and make a movie that's in an established franchise and to take risks and do new things. It's With got to be that tough. that you love. Yeah, it, it's you, you can't win. You, you, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I'll tell you who can win, though. Brie Larson and Captain Freaking Marvel. Ho, ho, ho. That movie has now crossed over the $1 billion worldwide box office. Uh, It is crazy how much money this movie is making. Have you seen Captain Marvel? Yes, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed the movie a lot, too. I thought it was a a really good, solid movie. It's not one of the best Marvel movies I've seen. Really solid. Um, And it's making a lot of money. And obviously, it's, you know... It's a origin story kind of this late into the MCU's phase three, uh, 
which I was a little worried about, but I think it did it really well. And then, of course, the the whole theme of, you know, this being the first, you know, woman-led uh, movie in the MCU, uh, along with the fact that it's kind of like the lead-in to Avengers Endgame, because we know her character is going to have an impact. It's making a lot of money, and it's going to continue to make money for a little while still. I'm, I I'm liking it. I like that. We're to this place now where we can have movies like Captain Marvel and Shazam coexist in the same year. Yeah. And kind of have their own successes because I'm quite sure you know the story of Captain Marvel and Shazam and yep, how that kind of caused a little controversy even today because one of the first things that when Captain Marvel was coming out was people was dropping fake reviews bashing yes. the movie because they were Shazam fans. Right, that or or people were very unhappy with, with, Brie the, with Brie Larson because she said, like, we need to have more diversity in interviews and we need to have more representation. And you know what? I'm all for that. I think that's great. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. But to intentionally try then to go out and, like, sabotage someone else's work or create a vision because someone said, hey, we need to be more inclusive. We need to have more representation of women or people of color. I mean... That just, oh, that's so, that's so backwards thinking. Yeah. And I think to, well, Marvel and DC for that matter, they have done an excellent job on kind of, and and actually met success with kind of just breaking barriers and making movies like Black Panther, Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy, with just the, and even... Well, I'm not going to say that one yet, but because you have to see the movie to understand what I was going to say with that. But right, but yep, so much diversity in these movies now, and it's cool, and it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. Right, and that's the most important part about it. It makes sense and it works. Yes, if I don't know if you remember it, but a little while back when Wonder Woman came out, James Cameron really. Oh yeah, he, he he made that statement that he's like, "Why are we patting, you know, patting everyone on the back because this is a a, a woman lead and a woman directed film?" Is like, we're just being self congratulatory that we're now getting around to showing strong women. He's like, "We've been showing strong women in movies for years now." He's like, "He's like, I've been doing it forever." It's like, okay, you need to not push your own agenda here, but like he was trying to make a point. Like this is all kind of like very self congratulatory post the me too movement and it kind of seemed like more of a, a reaction in the media and with uh you know the marketing departments and oh man did he ever get shouted down for those comments um but i i do agree i like the fact we're at a place delvin where we can have these amazing movies that are amazing movies that can break stereotypes break boundaries and in 2019, we're doing it not because we're trying to be inclusive in Hollywood, but because just it's natural and we should be, you know, we should be supporting films uh, other than the ones we kind of got in the past from all sorts of different sources and different avenues. And I like that. Yeah, I think Into the Spider-Verse plays it up best in the terms of how we had a Spider-Man-led movie that was successful with an African-American Latino kid as the main character. Yeah, Miles Morales, man. And people love that movie. Dude, I, man, that movie is so freaking good. Fantastic. So freaking good. I, I worried if I should let my boys watch it just because there is a little bit of death and they kind of address that. But my boys, I decided to let them watch it. They've watched that thing probably six or seven times already. They love it. And they know Peter Parker a little bit. And, of course, he is uh, in that movie, but man, they really like Miles Morales. Yes, they really like Miles Morales because he's the, super relatable. It's so well done because you get Peter Parker. Yeah, and it, you get Peter Parker in his prime, and Peter Parker not so much in his prime. <laughs> right, and then you get uh, Miles Morales, who is this up and comer, and you watch his story and you feel for him. And even better, you get Peter Porker, which is my yes. kid's actual favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Uh, have you heard of this oh, little movie that they're talking about making called uh, Black Widow? Yeah. It's so this 
this is going to be a big thing. They're they're at least the MCU's counting on this being a big thing, right? Yes. Big, big so, time. So, yeah, I mean, you got Scarlett Johansson, how do you not have a solo movie for her yet, right? Well, they've just announced that uh David Harbour, who is coming up in the new Hellboy movie, which looks really good to me, it and is. then also is uh Chief Hopper from Stranger Things is officially part of the cast of the new Black Widow movie. And apparently this is kind of still rumored, but apparently Rachel Wise is going to be in the cast as well. Um, like I said, Harbor's confirmed Wise's, you know, strong interest. They're, you know, they're saying she's going to be in it. I don't know what either of these two are going to be doing in the movie, but I know that I love both of these actors. And I can't wait for this movie, man. I'm excited I, for this. I'm just so interested because for the first time in a long time, we really don't know what the MCU is going to do. I know. We, we're we at this weird place where because of Endgame, everyone is kind of hush-hush and no one's no one's talking about any of it. We don't have a roadmap. Only thing we know that's coming out of Spider-Man for sure is Spider-Man Far From Home. We kind of know we kind of know they're working on Black Widow. We kind of know Black Panther 2 is probably coming out. We kind of know Doctor Strange, but we don't know we know there's – so officially we we have heard – I mean, we know Spider-Man Far From Home is happening because yeah. we've actually got previews for it. Yes. Um, trailers. And, and yeah, trailers for it. It's been, it's been filmed. We know that slated, there's a Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Doctor Strange 2, Black Panther 2, and Black Widow. Now, outside of that, there's no official word on pretty much anything else. And uh, they're being really hush-hush about it. I know Kevin Feige has said that he can't talk about Phase 4 because if he says anything about the real plans for Phase 4, it's going to be spoilers for Endgame. And they also rumored that the Eternals is getting a good movie. Yep, I have heard that I have heard that rumor. I know everyone's going to ask about the X-Men but reality is I don't think we're going to be getting an X-Men movie in the MCU for a while still. I mean, that literally, that merger just went through. They're just now back in the fold. Um, and I was just going to mention that, the fact that we're having an X-Men movie come out this year. I literally just saw the trailer for right, Dark, Dark Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little while. Now, I won't be surprised if maybe, maybe not an Endgame, but maybe... Uh, Maybe not Spider-Man because we know that's filmed, but maybe if like in a Doctor Strange or a Guardians of the Galaxy 3, we see some sort of a tease for an X-Men character or an X-Men movie. That won't surprise me because that still would put it out enough that they could figure a way, hey, here's how we want to introduce the X-Men into the MCU. Because that's going to take some work, how to figure that out. I think, personally, I think people are looking in the wrong direction. I think before you see the X-Men, you probably have a better chance of seeing the Fantastic Four. I, I don't disagree with you. I think that is a possibility as well. Because this, they've been going so long. And it, it seems like it might be a lot more easier to introduce a Reed Richards into yep. the MCU. And then just build up on that. Like, hey, Reed Richards meeting up with Tony Starks all of a sudden. And slowly but surely, it goes Fantastic Four. Totally possible. Totally possible. We'll have to see. Time will tell. Uh, speaking of time, time. do you have say, Yeah, do you have uh, anything else? That. Speaking of time, and speaking of what we said earlier with James Cameron, yeah, apparently we're getting that sequel to Terminator Two finally. Yeah, right. The sequel, you know, the, forgetting Terminator well, the, Three, Terminator that, Genesis, and Terminator uh, whatever that other just, one. Let's was. just call it the James Cameron sequel. Yes, now that he has the rights back, he's going to officially canonize this as his sequel and probably all the others are going to just, you know, be whatever out there. Non-canon, right? Yeah. And I think, did you see Genesis? I saw Genesis. I, I found it interesting. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it either though. I, I like that they tried to take the original one and kind of turn it on its head. I like, I liked it. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. There was, there was definitely good parts. It's all, it's all not canon anymore. Right. Right. Terminator. Dark Faith is the new one. 
and Lim- Linda Hamilton's coming back. Dude, Linda Hamilton, I don't even know how old she is, but I saw the the photos. Man, she still looks buff. She's immortal. <laughs> She's like uh, a Highlander uh, or something. Right. <laughs> there can be only one Sarah Connor. <laughs> How does she still look virtually the same? <laughs> like, it's amazing. I, I love you dropped the Highlander reference. I love that. I love Highlander. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. Uh, yeah, man. I, I tell you what. I loved the first two Terminator movies. The, the original 1984 Terminator is probably one of my favorite kind of like culty sci-fi movies and then terminator 2 obviously was more the big blockbuster action uh film and i love that i love that cameron's coming back and has got control again and has an idea for a story and is gonna go forward with it i just hope it lives up to the hype it's kind of weird how that direction went in terms of like the parallels between terminator and aliens is kind of uncanny yeah where the first aliens movie it's like a horror movie, just like right, the first Rid- Terminator yeah, movie. Ridley Scott, yep. Then the second Aliens movie is like an action movie, just like yep. Terminator. Yep. Then three on down from Aliens just fall apart, yeah, and the same thing can be apart. said. Same thing can be said about Terminator. So hopefully, Terminator can get back on track. Yeah, Aliens is that's a good comparison too, because obviously James Cameron did Aliens, the second movie. Yes, uh, Ridley Scott was Alien, the first one. But yeah, it, it it does feel very much the same thing. Kind of like, you know, sci-fi, kind of horror in the first one, and then it kind of goes to a little bit bigger blockbuster in the second one. And then all the rest are just crap. Yeah. And then what was the, oh gosh, what was the... Uh, Prometheus? Prometheus, yes. The one where it was kind of like the prequel for it. Well, oh, they just, scammed me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I gave you my money. I want my time and my money back. I think... I think Prometheus has a sequel, right? Yes, Alien Covenant. I watched that one too. Uh, they scammed me twice. <laughs> like, oh <my> God, <laughs> yeah, after Prometheus, I was like, no, no. I- I'm keeping my money. I'm going to give it to someone else. Yeah. Uh, I'm all out for Rebel Intelligence. Delvin, did you have anything else? I don't think I do. I think I'm all tapped out. Nice. Uh, okay, so last week... I had my brother on, I had Josh on, and we decided we were going to have, since it's kind of, you know, the the March Madness, we were going to have a conversation about the best video games of each generation. Now, we specifically said not our favorites, but what we considered to be the best of each generation. So, Delvin, let me ask you, what are your considerations for the best video game of each generation? So, we talked about the NES generation, the SNES Sega the N64, PS1, the PS2, uh, GameCube, uh, Xbox, and then the 360, PS3, and then the current generation. What would you say is, would you consider the best games of each of those generations? Okay, let's try to go down the list. The NES generation, NES generation, I would say Super Mario 3. I agree with you, man. Because it's, it's literally a game changer. Yep. On how we played games and how we experienced them. Super NES, I'd probably say Super Mario World. Mm, yeah. E- either Super Mario World or Link to the Past. Man, both both excellent contenders right there. And they yes. hold up very well. Yep. Now, see, this is where it gets tricky because I'm trying to get my math right. So the PS1 and uh, 64, 64 right? yeah. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I want to say I'm going to go Metal Gear Solid. Man, like that probably, I think that's, I think that's from Josh and I, that's where we came down to is Metal Gear Solid and Final Fantasy VII and we went with Final that's what Fantasy I was thinking, That's what I was thinking too. I was thinking Metal Gear Solid, Final Fantasy VII, or Resident Evil 2. Right? Yep. I, I hear you. Okay, so PS2, uh, Xbox era. Grand Theft Auto 3. Really? Grand Theft Auto 3? Because the, the open world in Grand Theft Auto 3 kind of changed the game, man. Just having that big world to explore and kind of do what you want to. Now, looking at it now, it's kind of hokey. Sure, but, sure. But, but at the time... At the time, it was revolutionary. Plus, the, people kind of sleep on the soundtrack. Just getting mm. in a car and playing actual music that you know. Like, yes. oh, this is cool. Yeah, that there was that, like, I used to just sometimes just drive around just to listen to the music. Yeah, and it was a um, it was a channel on there. I can't. It was like a comedy, 
almost like a podcast channel that was on there that that you could listen to on it while you were driving in the car. And it was literally with like a whole yeah. I what it's called laugh something. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember, but I do remember that. I also remember I listened to like the Rock Station a bunch as well yes. on that game. Uh, and, okay, so that was the the PS2, uh, the PS2 era. Uh, so PS3, uh, Xbox 360 era. Who do you got? Now this is where it gets hard because there's so many great games that you can. See, off, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of games like Bioshock, mm-hmm. The Last of Us. Yep. Um, I want to say GTA Five would probably be in that category. There's so many great games that came out in that generation that you could probably put up there. I'm gonna go with um, you know what? I'm gonna go up the last uh, Bioshock. We'll go with Bioshock definitely. Bi- Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite? The original Bioshock. Bioshock. Okay, the original Bioshock. All right, what do you got this generation? PS4, Xbox One, Switch. See, this is hard because, like I said, um, it's not what you think. What's your favorite? What do you think it's, is the best? Yes. It's the best. Yep. It's a toss-up, man. I want to say God of War. Oh, so good. It's some of the best gameplay slash storytelling I've ever played in the game. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta I gotta go God of War. God of War. Oh, that's good, man. See, my, my brother and I, we we really our debate was where do you drop The Last of Us? Because it technically came out on the PS3, but it was the very, very, very tail end of the generation, like yes. very tail end. The PS4 released shortly after that, and then they remastered it. Uh and put that out on the PS4. And like, it was like a, one of the launch titles basically on the PS4 you could get. And we, so we tossed the last of us in, in the current generation because of that fact. And that took the cake for us. I mean, it, it was like, literally like we were talking like God of war, Spider-Man last of us. And then like red dead redemption too. Like that was our final four. See and, my, my thing ooh. about the last of us is it's my, it's probably my favorite game of that, of any generation. But my problem with it is, is it groundbreaking enough in terms of how, because The Last of Us is a perfect version of Uncharted. Uh, I mean. It's Naughty Dog seeing their yeah. vision to yeah. its yeah, fullest potential of, in terms of storytelling and how everything Gameplay. goes. Oh. Gameplay, everything coming together in one big masterpiece. Yeah. So it's kind of like, do you go with that one? Do you go with Uncharted Two? But yeah, then we, we went. Get- we went Uncharted Two during the PS3 era. It, that that was our that was our winner. Well, let's go over to the Super Friends. Let's see what the Super Friends have to say. We're going to start on our email. We got Peter Christensen. He says, "Dear nerds, how dare you start a podcast without checking if we're ready to do this? I wasn't ready to do this. Yeah, sorry, Peter. It happens occasionally." Uh, he says, plus one for the Hot Ones show. That host is one of the best, most prepared interviewers I've ever seen. Seeing Terry Crews have hot sauce hallucinations was priceless. I love that show. I've come into it recently. I'm going to get my former coworkers and I to do a Hot Ones challenge, and I, I may film it. Oh, uh, oh, oh, stop. Stop the presses. He said that host is one of the best interviewers he's ever seen. Most, most prepared interviewers. Most prepared. He, he, he just brushed over you and brushed over me. Man, I'm not prepared. I just show up and do my thing. <laughs> Shh, don't tell them that. <laughs> he didn't know that till you said that. <laughs> no, he knows that. He's been on the show. <laughs> uh, he says, I'm very curious about the ghost of Don Rickles doing Mr. Potato Head. Disney has a very, very, very long view of entertainment and is not afraid to take risks on technologies in order to get practice and work perfecting them. People were horrified by the uncanny valley of the Polar Express, but digital motion capture characters are par for the course. The de-aged Jeff Bridges in Tron Legacy was creepy, but the de-aged Tony Stark in Captain America Civil War or Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer in Ant-Man and the Wasp blended right into the movie. They were maybe ahead of the technology in Rogue One, 
but it's only going to get more common and more convincing and blend into the background of movie magic. Yeah, I really do. I really do think that they're going to be able to to take posthumously Don Rickles' voice and edit it into Toy Story 4 seamlessly. I really do think that that's going to be a thing. Uh, you know uh, what? I'm honestly fine with it. Yeah, if, I, I if, think it's great. I mean, if the family's fine with it, I'm fine I'm, with it. And I think it's cool. Like for not to get morbid, but I would think it would be cool if like something would happen to me and I would to pass away and my family could say, hey, we can still look at dad and hear things that he would say in the future. Like he was right. still there almost. Well, and the family the family did ask if they could put him into the film and if they could edit his audio to give him lines. So it you know, they're they're totally cool with this. I'm totally cool with this. I can't wait for that movie and I can't wait to hear the performance. So Yeah, but because it was it was a big discussion not too long ago about this whole thing when um Princess Leia died. Yep. Because yeah, the whole it, argument was whether they were gonna put her in the final movie. Right. And we know they are. They've yes. got footage that they're going to use her. So, yeah, same thing. It's an it's an interesting topic. Uh, Peter does go on to say, here are my picks for the video game champions. The NES era, Super Mario 3, runner-up Legend of Zelda. The SNES Sega, Zelda Link to the Past, honorable mentions to Sonic and Super Mario World for establishing the 16-bit consoles. N64 PS1, Final Fantasy 7. I agree with you there, Peter. He says, and I had to tap out there. For mobile phone casual games, I choose the Angry Birds franchise. Cheers, oh, that's Peter one of the ones we didn't get, it, mobile games. I know. We, Josh and I didn't even think about mobile games. I mean, we really were talking about consoles, so mobile's kind of you know out there. But uh, once again, Super Friends, if you want to write in a long-form answer like Peter does, you can reach us at our email, which is fortofnerd at gmail.com. Uh, let's go over to Facebook, where you can find us, facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd. And we've got Caleb Albers. Caleb says, I was an unfortunate child that didn't get to play too many of the classic games until I was much older. So I'm basing my choices on games I played when I was older. So I'm choosing Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga for Game Boy Advance, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64, Mario Kart Double Dash for GameCube, Ultimate Spider-Man for Xbox, Skyrim for Xbox 360, For Honor for Xbox One, and I'm going to cheat with Red Dead Redemption 2 and Spider-Man for PS4. But, gun to my head, I'm giving it to Spidey. A lot of these games I've only played on emulators on my computer, but they are still fun nonetheless. I like that. Caleb's a little bit younger, so obviously he's not going to have as uh, deep a knowledge on some of the original consoles. But uh, I like, though, the fact that he's gone out there and gotten those uh, through emulation and able to play them. That's cool. Yeah, that's definitely cool. I always say play what you can play at, man. It's about to have right. fun. People take it too serious sometimes right. in terms of, oh, you're playing. On no, play what you can play and have fun with it. That's what video games are for. Absolutely, man. Uh, going over to Twitter, at Ford of Nerd. Uh, that's how you can reach us. I've got Hollywood Bones, Patrick Novacell, at Nova Beyond. He says... This is my personal list. Keep that in mind. The NES, Tecmo Super Bowl. That's a good game. Sega, Sonic 2. Sonic and Tails, I think, is actually the the full title of that one. That is correct. Uh, SNES, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. That's actually a fun game. Really? It's a fun beat-em-up. Yeah, it's a fun beat-em-up game. I uh, I wasn't. A I don't know if I would call it the best of my generation, but it's a, a really best fun. Of, a best of the game. SNES generation. Yeah. All right, uh, N64 Goldeneye. I mean, I mean that that's always Classic. in that discussion. Uh, PS1 Resident Evil, obviously always in the discussion. Yep. PS2 Xbox GTA Vice City. I did love Vice City. I love that throwback to the '80s Miami kind of feel. Yeah, I did. Vice City's awesome. I did like that game. Uh, PS3, Xbox, The Last of Us. Yeah, you can't go wrong there. And then PS4, Xbox One, Spider-Man. He says, I would replay all of these in an instant. Those are good choices. Those are good choices, Patrick. I like it. I do like it. Uh, Tim Pollan at tpollan20 says, Spencer and Josh, you made some tough choices. Here's mine. NES, Contra. Great choice. I love Love that game. Sega, NBA Jam. That was in our discussion. Uh, SNES Top Gear. PS1, uh, 
Toka Championship Racing, PS2 Xbox, Midnight Club. He's a racing guy. Yeah, I was like racing, racing. I'm like, the, I'm like SNES, PS1, and PS2 are all racing games. PS3, Xbox 360 is Uncharted 2. I'm with you there. And then PS4, Xbox One, Red Dead Redemption 2. I like which, it. Which was so close for me and my brother on on that one. He says, I could have easily inserted The Last of Us in the last two brackets. Yeah, I get it, Tim. You know I'm what game you. we have no, nobody's mentioned yet that I just thought about? Street Fighter 2. Uh, Josh and I talked about that some. It was it was in our bracket. Um, I'm trying to remember here because I actually still have the entire bracket system right here on this piece of paper. You can see, awesome. and uh, we had Street Fighter two in the uh, in the first round of the of the SNES generation, and it lost out to Mortal Kombat. Interesting. Yeah, we we thought Mo- Mortal Kombat was actually the better of the the beat 'em up fighters. Uh, of uh, of that generation. That's an interesting take. I'm not mad at it though. I think they play very differently. Yeah, very differently. Uh moving on, we got Romaine, Nick Fallhaber at Romaine. He says uh NES is Mario 3. SNES Chrono Trigger. Man, I love that game. It's a personal favorite, but I had a hard time trying to find a slot for it in that generation. Uh Game Boy Link's Awakening. It's a good game. PS1 and 64 Final Fantasy Tactics. People like that game a lot. I I know. I just uh I couldn't slot that over FF7. Um Xbox uh X he uh, says Xbox PS4 GameCube which can't be I don't think he means PS4 there. But uh he says Ninja Gaiden. Oh, the, um I know what he's talking about. That's a really good game. Yeah. That's a hard game. <clears throat> yeah, it's a hard game. Uh the DS PSP Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. That's a good choice for for that kind of generation. I, I like that. 360 PS3 Bayonetta. That's a good game too. That's a good one. He says Wii U Splatoon, which is kind of weird because we didn't put the Wii U kind of in a console generation because it was kind of between console generations. Nintendo kind of got off with kind of their their uh, the whole their, their cycle. Yeah, and then he says 3DS Vita Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. I think uh, Nick Fallhaber is a fan of the Monster Hunter series. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Good, good choices. Good choices. And just to remind you, we went with Super Mario 3 from the NES generation, Donkey Kong Country from the SNES Sega, Final Fantasy 7 from the PS1, Halo from the Xbox, Uncharted 2 from PS3, and The Last of Us on PS4. That's where we kind of came out. That's good. So you That's can see... there. There's a lot, and I think the thing too is when my brother and I were doing this is we noticed that a lot of the ones we consider the best games tended to fall into a lot of other people's lists as well. So I'm glad it's not just like my brother and I picking these weird random games that you know no one else agrees with. Uh, we also have a voicemail tonight. I uh, let's 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 give it a listen. I think I know who this is. I think it might be Spider Man, but l- let's listen. What's up, Fortress of Nerditude? This is Paul Calico coming at you for your question of the week. Sorry, I've been a little absent of late. Some things are going down in my life, and I'm trying to take care of them. But um, <clears throat> greatest video games of each generation. NES, Mario 3. Has to be Mario 3. Super NES, Turtles in Time. GameCube, I'm going to have to say Star Fox Assault, I think it was. It's a Star Fox game where you can land the R-Wing and get out. You have a, I think Fox has a staff or something, but you can also run around on the level getting them the, the Land Rover and blast things with the tank. It was pretty cool. Uh, then we'll go up to Switch. Uh, my favorite game on the Switch so far has been Breath of the Wild. Just so much to do in that game. All right, now for PlayStation 1, going to have to say Final Fantasy 7 and Metal Gear Solid. Those two games are essential. PlayStation 2, I'm going to have to go with God of War. PlayStation 3, God of War 3. PlayStation 4, God of War. Let's see, what else, what do we got in here? Um, Xbox, Knights of the Old Republic, hands down. Xbox 360, I'm going to have to go Gears of War and Mass Effect. Oh, I missed Nintendo 64. I missed 64. It'll probably be Star Fox 64. I don't have an Xbox One, guys, so 
don't really know where to answer on that one. Um, I think that's it. Hope you guys are doing well, and um, elf time. All right, Delvin. So Paul Calico comes in, and he says, God of War on the PS2, God of War 3 for the PS3, and then God of War for the PS4. He also comes in with, like, two different Star Foxes, uh, and then Turtles in Time, Super Mario 3. I, th- I think he's a fan of the God of War series and the, and the, the uh, whatchamacallit, the Star Fox quite a bit. We just established that Paul has terrible taste in video games. <laughs> 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 I'm just messing with you, Paul. That's, nah, it's, Paul. It's a great list. I think it shows. It's cool hearing people's list and pe- people's taste because you kind of see their feel for video games. Like, um, based off his list, I'll take that he likes the action genre, like the, because the God yep. of War games kind of have that rhythm feel to it with the battle system and things like yep. that. And Total yeah, Time sure. kind of had beat him up almost, like, yeah. Yep. Yep. And then, but, but then he also picked Final Fantasy VII. I mean, that's like the quintessential RPG turn based. You know, that's, that's kind of a different thing. But you're right, Delvin. Like, you do kind of get like a little window into, you know, where people's headspace is at when they're trying to determine what they feel is like the best games of each generation. Yes. And I think, I think a lot of people are picking Final Fantasy VII because it's probably most people's first RPG. Oh, for sure. For a lot of people, that's definitely like their big introduction into the RPG world. I had I had a hard time trying not to slot in a Final Fantasy game in almost every single generation, but I had to be honest and like, okay, realistically, was there a Final Fantasy game on the PS2 generation that was like better than a lot of other stuff that would be like the best of that? And I was like, I love Final Fantasy X. It's a personal favorite. And it had voice acting. It was great. But I mean, is it really better than Halo, which came out that same generation? It's not. Sadly. Sadly, sadly. But anyway, super friends, if uh, if you want to leave a voicemail like Paul Calico, you can always dial us in. That's 801-477-7687. And uh, we will listen to your voicemail on the podcast. Thank you so much. I... I love hearing from the super friends. It's my favorite part of each and every week. Uh, Delvin, the super friends are out there. They're listening to the podcast. How can they help out the Fortress of Nerditude this week? You go on your favorite podcast app, whether it's iTunes like I use, give the podcast five stars, five Boom. stars, five stars. That helps people find the podcast. Yep. And that's very important. Tell a friend, man. I always say that. Tell a friend. Or it's just like take share- somebody's phone and just just subscribe <laughs> to the podcast. Just take, that's right. random, take, yeah, when, when you- take somebody's phone and just subscribe. <laughs> when someone says, hey, look at the pictures of my kid, and they hand you your phone, you start pretending like you're looking at it, but you're really subscribing to the Fortress of Nerditude on their podcast app. Yeah, that's all you do. I, li- <laughs> I, li- I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me randomly sign you up for a newsletter and a podcast and a free magazine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like it. <laughs> uh, Delvin, let me ask you a question. Have you seen the new Joker trailer that was released? Yes, I have. Okay. So what are your are your thoughts on this trailer? I like the direction it's going into. Okay. I like the fact that it's kind of pulling from people's knowledge of the Joker in terms of like the killing joke, which is yep. everybody knows the killing joke by now and kind of building, building upon that. And I think it's giving you a version of Joker that people are going to enjoy. Yeah. So for maybe some of the Fortress of Nerditude uh, super friends who might not know, the killing joke was basically kind of... They kind of basically took a story that had existed back in the past in the Joker's history and they kind of brought it into the future and kind of redid it a little bit where basically the Joker is, uh, well, he kind of like works in, I don't want to say a warehouse, but he works kind of like in a a chemical factory, right? And he decides that he's going to rob the place and help these guys rob it and he's kind of forced into it and then they dress him up so he looks like the Red Hood, which was some criminal and Batman ends up showing up 
and he gets knocked into a vat of chemicals and it changes his appearance, right? It bleaches his skin, turns his yes. lips purple, uh, or turns his lips red, uh, turns his hair green, you know, kind of gives him what we come to, to know as the, the look of the Joker. And then of course, like he, you know, becomes extremely mentally unbalanced. He was trying to be a stand up comedian, but was failing at it. He was basically failing at life. Yeah. Yeah, basically just failing at everything, right? And that was the killing joke. Like, And then, you know, obviously it catches up with him being the Joker. And then, obviously, in the killing joke, you know, he ends up shooting Barbara Gordon and paralyzes her. And that was kind of a big thing, right? Because it was actually one of, like, Batman's ally- allies that gets kind of, like, taken out of the action. Um, And then at the end of the killing joke, there's always that part where does Batman kill the Joker at the end of it? You know, it was left very open where they're sitting down and they start laughing and then the laughing abruptly ends. Yeah, because um, the killing joke is the whole, the whole point of the killing joke is Joker is trying to find how far he can push Commissioner Gordon before yeah. he snaps. Because he says, all he's basically saying is every good man just needs one bad day before they become me. Right. Right, which is which is interesting because you get that sense in this in this uh, trailer that we saw that this character they use the name Arthur that he has what appears to be a horrible day, and he or it looks like they're also kind of hinting that he already has mental illness, and he has one dip, bad day that kind of pushes him over the edge, right? And the idea that, you know, he's doing that in the killing joke uh, to Commissioner Gordon is that that theme is here. So, like, I I definitely agree with you. I see a lot of the background and history of the killing joke in this trailer. Now, let me ask you this. Joaquin Phoenix, do you think he's going to be able to pull off this character based just solely on this trailer? Based off the trailer, I think definitely. I think... He adds a feel to the character that feels natural. And he always, and honestly speaking, Joaquin Phoenix kind of looks like he's nutty anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you just look at the roles he's played, uh-huh. he, never, he never really felt like a stable person. So it kind of almost feels like it fits the character. Yeah. He fit- he, he's a good character actor. Yes. And this feels very much like right up his alley that he could play. This kind of like manic, crazy and don't get me wrong, like, it definitely looks like it has a different feel from, like, Heath Ledger's version of the Joker. Yes, definitely. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think having, having it be a little different is a, is a good thing. Uh, do you think we're going to see... Okay, let me rephrase this. Do you think we see Batman in this film at all? I would hope so. At, at least as a small cameo. I don't want him to be a major focus in the film. But I would hope that we'd see him to the point where you get... Because I'm not sure when this movie's set. Is it set in the 90s? I'm not exactly sure what the time frame is. But I do know that Thomas Wayne is a major character in the film. Okay, I didn't know that. that yeah. That's, okay, then that... Yeah, so Thomas, Thomas Wayne's a major character in this film. And Bruce Wayne is in this. So if you watch the little trailer... The little boy that, you know, he kind of reaches, you see uh, Arthur kind of reach through the bars and kind of like, you know, force his mouth into a smile. Yes. That actor is actually, if you go to the IMDb, he's playing Bruce Wayne. Okay, that's cool. So to me, that kid looks like he's about eight years old. And that is, that is Bruce Wayne's age. Typically in the comics, when... He loses his mom and dad, Martha and Thomas. Okay. Then that's really cool. Then I think I want to see where they go with it then. Yeah. I want to see what makes the Joker the Joker. I want to see how far they're going to take it. And I want to see if it's going to be really a Joker Joker movie. If it's going to yeah. be a Joker movie, let it be a Joker movie in terms of like no Batman, not even any references to Batman. It's, it's Joker's story, almost yeah. like Venom was. Yeah. Okay. The character Venom yeah, yeah. is an integral part of Spider Man. But the movie but they, has nothing to do with Spider Man whatsoever. Right. I I want this 
I want this to be a Joker only movie. I know they've said that this is not part of technically kind of like the DCEU like main timeline. This is kind of just a standalone movie. And I want it to not have Batman in it. I'm okay with Bruce being there as a kid. I'm okay with Thomas Wayne. I'm okay with all the kind of the accoutrements of Gotham City, right? But I want it to be a Joker story because I feel like the Joker is, I mean, he's obviously the arch villain to Batman, but he is a very iconic villain. And I think doing a solo movie where if you look at the MCU and you look at the DCEU up to this point, we've had a lot of origin story movies of heroes. This would be the first that would truly be about a villain though. And I think that that's a, that's a really good thing to try to do. It's different. It's unique. And if it's done well, it could be fantastic. Yeah, and I think they have the right actor for it. Yeah. Um, some other things I thought was really good about this trailer is the music they picked. Um, because they're, they were playing some, uh, oh, uh, Frank Sinatra. But the way they were kind of playing it and with what they were kind of showing, it it definitely like did not feel like this is like the music you would imagine would be playing over like the violence and some of the things you're seeing. And so like that dichotomy really just kind of stuck with me. Like it really made me think like, okay, there's things that are going to happen in this movie that are going to go to a dark, dark place just based on the music that they were using. Yeah. I like the direction the music is going. I like that it's taking that direction where you don't, it's not what you expect. Right. We're not hearing the big kind of the bum bum, you know, all these like low bass tones and like the inception bum, you know, yeah. noise. They're they're not doing that. Like that's the Dark Knight trilogy stuff to a T. But instead they're playing, you know, like Frank Sinatra over it. You know what it reminds me of? The mm. Us trailer. Oh. In terms of how Us took a song that has nothing to do with horror. Right. But flipped it in a way where it's almost chilling. Yes, yes. Haunting, chilling. I think that is a perfect way of describing it, right? Yes. Like the song on its own is fine, but then with what the juxtaposition with what you're seeing, like you're not going to hear that song the same way for a little while. Yeah. And, and I like that. I, I, I like it when trailers do things that uh, I'm not expecting. Um, I, I don't know... I don't know if we're going to get any time travel or time, I'll maybe not say time travel, but time manipulation. I don't know if maybe at the beginning of the movie, we're going to see the Joker in his current day form. And maybe we do see a little bit of Batman and then he's reminiscing about how he got, got his beginning or something. And then we go back in time or if this is truly just going to be kind of, you know, back in the history of the character through the entire time. I don't know, but I'm curious to see how that's going to play out. Yeah, uh, I hope it pays off personally. I hope. Yeah, me too. Me freaking too. Uh, this is coming out in October. November, end of October. I think it's October. Man, if they drop this thing like the very end of October, like right around the Halloween season, which typically is when like you get October is like the month for like horror movies. Yes. And then if they drop a big, massive, like super villain movie in there, that would be freaking cool. That could be really cool. That would be really cool because I don't go to the movies a lot in October because it's all like horror stuff and I don't care for horror movies <laughs> at all. I'm a big scaredy cat is what I'm trying to say, Delvin. Nothing uh, wrong with that. So yeah, like September movies I see, November movies I see, October movies, no, not so much. Um, so let's, I thought it'd be kind of a cool idea if we could go back and actually talk about the character of the Joker. So we've seen this trailer, we're excited for it, we're excited to see this direction, but Maybe do a spotlight on the character of the Joker itself, like how the character was created, what it was designed to be, some of the big high points of the character, and why the character of the Joker is so iconic, because it is an extremely iconic character in the the DC world. So obviously, if we're going to talk about the history of the Joker, you got to go right back to Bill Finger, Bob Kane, and Jerry Robinson. I mean, Bill... Bill Finger and Bob Kane obviously are the creators of Batman. And obviously the Joker came out like right at the very beginning. So uh, 
the Joker was, you know, created uh, right around the same time. What's interesting, which I didn't know, because I just assumed I, that... I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, I just assumed that they thought like, oh, we need to come up with some sort of a character, some sort of a villain. But what they did is that there was a 1928 film called The Man Who Laughs, where there's this character who's uh, kind of ha- this... Um, has like this disfigured face that perpetually gives him a grin. And that was the inspiration for the Joker. And then Bill Finger and Bob Kane asked Robinson to Jerry Robinson to basically sketch kind of a Joker playing card. And he basically kind of took a picture of the actor, Conrad Veidt, who, uh, who was in the man who laughs and kind of use that sketch. And like, if you look at the sketch of that Joker playing card from Jerry Robinson, this concept sketch in 1940, it realistically becomes very close to the basis of how the Joker's look was right from the get go. Yeah. Did you know that Joker was not supposed to be a permanent character? I did know that, uh, that they were going to kill him off right away. Yes. Like he was going to die in the issue. He was debuted, which in comics, it's not uncommon, right? For some villain, some thug to show up, be in an episode, uh, be in a, you know, a comic, be in, be in one or two maybe, and then be gone. Especially in Batman at that time. Because Batman at that time did kill. He did kill. And he was just, he was more of kind of like, you know, like they said, he was a detective, right? And so he, he carried a gun. He was more kind of like the, the PI detective, uh, you know, kind of genre that was around at that time interesting to note though bob kane bill finger wanted to kill him off but it was the editors at detective comics at dc that basically said like no 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 you need to keep him batman needs to have a foil batman needs to have uh, a relationship with this villain similar to kind of the sherlock holmes professor moriarty uh, relationship in the Sherlock Holmes books by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And so it wasn't even the intention of the creators to keep the Joker, which is nuts to me to think that they didn't even, like, yeah. he was just a one and done, but the editors it's, said, no, no, no. It's kind of weird to think about where Batman, the character, would be without the Joker. Right. Because he's such an integral part of why we love Batman. He's and the Joker, the thing I always like about the Joker is the fact that everything that the Joker kind of on the outside looks like is technically happiness. Like he's a clown. Clown's supposed to bring joy to your life and things like that. But he is the complete opposite of that. He brings fear. And I, I want to say he's the re- he's probably the reason why a lot of people are afraid of clowns today. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that and, you know, John Wayne Gacy and, you know, it and a few other things. But, right, but you go back to, you know, like the, in the 1940s, yeah, he, he was a killer clown, right? He was not a nice person. Yes. So so he's created in the in 1940 by Finger Kane and Robinson. He's inspired by a 1928 film. Uh, about a disfigured man who's forced to smile. So obviously we get the Joker with the big smile. The interesting thing when he was first originally created is that, uh, you know, he, the character really had a lot of things that, you know, he, he would go around and he would try to get Batman and try to kill Batman. And even though he would, even though he would like harass Batman and do all these horrible things, there was always this level of like, Joker just never was really able to ever one up Batman and like really kind of get on top, so to speak. But Batman wasn't able to really get on top of Joker either, right? Like it just kind of was like back and forth, back and forth. Like it felt like you're watching like a competition where no one's going to be the clear winner. It's just going to continue on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, sort of like a level of one upsmanship. And that's right. one of the things that people, one of the biggest misconceptions about the Joker is the fact that he doesn't want to kill Batman. No. He is quite the opposite. He wants Batman to be around because he enjoys Batman's company. Batman is the most interesting thing in his life. And uh, the, 
The interesting thing too about that though, Delvin, is that he's, he's also trying to break Batman. He doesn't want to kill him. He wants to break him. He wants to see if he can push him over the edge and get Batman to do things that Batman wouldn't and push him into his reality. Because like you said earlier, the Joker has this belief that one bad day can push anyone into his territory and into his realm, right? I was saying one of my favorite Joker stories is um the death of the family. Uh-huh. And I love that story because it's simply Joker just in, in the story. Well, one of the things in the story that's interesting is Joker cuts off his face and it just right. staples it back on, which is crazy enough as it is. But yep. the whole point of the story is he realizes that he's never going to get the love for Batman that Batman gives his extended family in mm-hmm. terms of Robin and Nightwing and Red Hood. So he's like, you know what? I need to take out this family so Batman right. can only have his attention on me. Yep. And it's such an interesting way to look at things in terms of like most villains look at it like I need to get rid of Batman because Batman is my foil. Joker took it to the way like, no, I want Batman to pay attention to me. I want Batman to use all his focus on me. So to get to Batman, yeah. I am going to make a concentrated effort to take out everyone he cares about. So he can have so nobody's around, so all he can do is have his time to focus on me. Yeah, he's very codependent. <laughs> yes. I mean, he he really, really needs all of Batman's attention. And the interesting thing too about this is that like this whole concept of the character of the Joker, like one this kind of idea of one bad day, is that realistically, the Joker and the Batman are two sides of the same coin. They both have a horrible day, right? You've got Bruce Wayne losing his mom and his dad and deciding that, you know, he's going to embrace, embrace his humanity and find a way to grow out of that experience and find the good and, you know, try to be a shining light. Whereas the Joker has this horrible tragedy that happens and he embraces the chaos and the madness. But it's realistically, they both have this crucible and just one went one way and one went the other way. But it's that same kind of thing. And so like there is that dichotomy between the two that, you know, that yin and yang between these characters, which makes them perfect to be, you know, foils for each other going forward, you know, from the creation all the way kind of through it. Now, Joker starts off as very much like a sadistic killer. He's kind of a serial killer. He kills a bunch of people. But obviously, you know, we know he doesn't kill Batman. But then we get to this time period where we start getting into the 1950s. And in the 1950s, you know, there was, this is the Silver Age, right? Uh, The Silver Age of comics. But there was some uh, congressmen, people in the government that thought, hey, we've got a problem. Comics are going to, you know, make our youths all degenerates and cause problems. So comics came up with the, you know, the comic code authority, right? They tried to self-police themselves in order to help keep things under check so that comics could still be sold and so that they weren't just completely outlawed. Because of that, though, the character of the Joker went from being like this sadistic serial killer, maniacal clown to more of the campy comedy uh, clown that a lot of people are familiar with in in the comics where it's it's really 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 kind of a watered down version it's just let, let's put it this way everyone remembers the 196 even if you haven't seen it the 1966 Batman TV series C- Caesar Romero's portrayal of of the Joker all the laughing all the giggling all the kind of the crazy like little stunts and pranks I mean, he became a, a a trickster and a prankster more than anything and less of a criminal killer. But that was because they had to because his character was so out there and on the edge that if they didn't kind of self-police, Batman probably would have been shut down. Yeah, because comic books was going through that phase that video games kind of went through in the 90s where yep. everybody was blaming comic books for all their problems and 
your kids are not acting right. Well, it's because they read those damn comic books and this, this, that. Same thing happened with video games in the 90s where they tried to censor video games and the same thing, just like the video games company did with the ESRB. Comic books yeah. tried to do the same thing. And unfortunately, at the time in the Silver Age, a lot of comic books got watered down. I want to say till like the 80s, right? Yeah, it, it really was like the very late 70s, early 80s is when you started seeing uh, a the, big the kind Frank of change. Millers. Yep. Yeah, it, I mean, it really was like, right, the, the Frank Miller um, take on Batman, right? The Dark Knight Returns in 1986. Yes. Really kind of right around that time. I, I mean, I'm going to say like right around that, you know, mid mid 80s is really when comics kind of got away from kind of what they had to do in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s and could tell more more darker stories again, more gripping, realistic stories. Um, 86, you get, you know, The Dark Knight Returns. Uh, you mentioned uh, A Death in the Family, which was the kind of the 88, 89 story arc of uh, A Death in the Family. And it was uh, 1988 when Alan Moore and Brian Boland wrote The Killing Joke. And... The Killing Joke really was, I mean, it really is like the big standout kind of Joker story. And it definitely took, it definitely took things in a very, very dark, dark uh, route. And The Killing Joke is also like kind of the basis of a lot of other portrayals of, of, uh, of the character of the Joker. I mean, 1989's Batman, Tim Burton used, you know, a lot of elements from the killing joke to tell kind of his origin of Jack Napier's Joker, right? So we get, we get the kind of the campy Joker, the Cesar Romero in, in the sixties show through most of the sixties and seventies. He's just kind of, you know, the, he uses like the Joker gas and the Joker, you know, acid or whatever, like all these kind of like kind of tongue in cheek, little, you know, plots and ploys to get after Batman but then you get into the 80s and you get the killing joke, you get death in the family, the dark knight returns. And then we start getting into the movies. So like 1989 we get Jack Nicholson who plays the Joker in the movie Batman. What was your view of Jack Nicholson's Joker? At the time when it came out it was revolutionary. Yeah? Because people probably look at it now and say oh this is campy but that movie was really dark for its time. Like you had move, you had like Superman, yep, that came out earlier, that was bright and colorful, and you know, even what people wanted to see as Superman. Whereas Batman, people's the mainstream audiences thought of Batman like Batman sixty six and all these um, bat rep- uh, shark repelling and stuff like that. So <laughs> right, when yeah. Tim Burton came out with this darker take that was much more closer to the comic books. It was really cool and seeing this version of Joker who was Jack Nicholson was really sadistic as Joker. Oh, yeah. There are some really dark scenes in that movie that people kind of just brush over. Right. But like his like his girlfriend for that matter in the movie. Uh-huh. And the tragic story behind her. Yes. You gotta you gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh I I really like Jack Nicholson's portrayal. I really do like that it kind of was close to the killing joke as far as background. And I remember Jack Napier, you know, he was the one that ended up killing Thomas and Martha. And a lot of people are like, you know, where's this name Jack Napier? Because that hadn't technically been a name that a lot of people had seen in the comics, which is funny because a number of years, it's just like a year ago, maybe they said like that was actually Joker's real name going all the way back to the very beginning. Um, which kind of retcons the 1989 Batman, um, which I kind of thought was kind of interesting uh, because the Joker, right? Because he is mentally insane and uh, unstable. He is an unreliable narrator when he talks because sometimes he tells his background one way, sometimes it's another. He kind of makes light of that. He plays off of that. And so, which makes it great for new writers because they can retell the Joker's origin and they can go with something that's established or they can also, you know, change it a little bit, which we kind of saw with Heath Ledger's Joker in, uh, the dark Knight returns is the dark Knight return. No, uh, the dark Knight. dark Knight. 
<clears throat> yeah. Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, <clears throat> Dark Knight Returns is the actual comic. Yeah. In the Dark Knight, you know, he kind of doesn't, you know, doesn't really give us maybe a reliable background for how he got his scars and how he came to be. You know, we don't get a lot of origin there, which is another great take on the character, right? Yes. Have you seen what DC is doing with that now? Uh, No, I don't know that I have. That apparently... Back, well, the story's not finished yet, but apparently there's three Jokers. Really? Yes. Huh. I'm going to be interesting to see how that plays three out. Three Jokers, and each one of them is like a different version of the ones you've seen in history. That like could be cool. The one that's actually the classic Joker that we know and love. Then you have the one that's the modern day Joker that's in the comic books today, and it's another Joker. Hmm. So all the Jokers that we've seen that, that were in past comic books are actually the not the same guy, essentially. Really? Yes. That's, kind of an in- that's kind of an interesting take on it. Uh, I want to talk real quickly about the one Joker that we haven't talked about, his portrayal. Mark Hamill the as the Joker. Joker. I mean, the for my money, that voice as the Joker is hands down the best voice. Yes. Like, I just love, I mean, he started playing that in what Batman, the animated series. Yes. And then he's done it in, I think Batman beyond he's done it like through a whole bunch everywhere. of video yeah, games. Video, video games. There has been a couple times where he hasn't done the voice. I know Troy Baker uh, has done the voice before, but I mean, if you're thinking of the voice, just the voice of the Joker, there's a massive, massive generation or two generations that only know Mark Hamill as the Joker, which is crazy because obviously Mark Hamill to us was known originally as Luke Skywalker. And and he went on to have this fantastic voice career as the Joker. And I mean, I, I can't hear the Joker without hearing Mark Hamill's Joker. Yes, his Joker to me is the definitive Joker because... He's everything you want to see in Joker. In right. terms of he says the sly, funny comments, then he gets these outbursts that are so uneasy and uncomfortable. It's almost scary. Yeah. Let me let me ask you this, Delvin. Why do you think people love the Joker so much? Because obviously he is a very, very loved villain. Like people want to people would rather see a Batman film or a Batman show with the Joker versus almost any of his other, uh, you know, villains like the penguin or, you know, a poison Ivy two face. Uh, but Joker is always the one that people want to come back to. Why do you think that is? What's the love there? What's the draw? I think people love the Joker because in many ways, Joker is Batman. Batman is Joker. Their, their, their connection, their bond is one of the greatest funny to say this romances in comic books ever in terms of how you can't have one without the other the yin and the yang and there's like I said there's nothing like Joker doesn't have any superpowers or anything like that right he, he's essentially just a crazy person who can take a lot of pain who can take yeah who can take a lot of pain and the thing about that makes Joker interesting is you never know what he's gonna do and how he's going to do it. Like most villains, and Batman rogues are good for this. They have a set plan. They have a certain set goal they want to have, do. And a lot of times it's either defeating Batman or killing Batman for that matter. Right. The Joker's goal is not necessarily to kill the Batman. I, one, of the, like, one of the best examples of that is the fact that um, Injustice. Yeah. You ever played the Injustice games? Yep. He essentially destroyed Metropolis because he felt like it. Right. And killed and, it's, and spoilers for Injustice which is a ten, almost 10 year old game now. And it's the beginning of the cutscene of the game. He, in, he ends up killing Lois Lane and making Superman do it. Yeah. And Superman snaps and kills the Joker. And this is it, the kind of effect that the Joker has on people that he can drive the most noble of the heroes to the brink of insanity to do the unthinkable. It's, it's interesting that you said that, you know, Joker's, you know, doesn't possess like superpowers. He's just, you know, 
kind of a crazy person, you know, and we said, you know, could take a lot of pain because his flip side is the Batman who does not have superpowers. He's a, you know, wealthy playboy, you know, who wears body armor and, you know, is this, you know, great detective and really smart, but he doesn't like, he doesn't possess, he's not like Superman, right? He's not some yeah. alien from another world that possesses this, you know, the ability to fly and, you know, he can bounce bullets off his skin naturally. But the interesting thing is though, is that I would say that the intellect though of Batman and of the Joker uh, is really what I think helps set both of them apart. I mean, because yeah. Joker knows how to find the weak points in people's personalities in their psyche and then press and press hard in order to get them to turn. I mean, we, we saw that in The Dark Knight, right? When he turns Harvey Dent into Two-Face. That was calculated. It was it was cold. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, he also d- did that with Harley Quinn. Yeah. Harley Quinzel was his doctor, essentially, was trying to heal him, but his smoothness and his calculatedness made him, made her sympathetic towards him. Because he threw on that charm. And that's one of the things about the Joker that makes him so interesting. That he can, almost like Captain America, he can inspire people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. In just a slightly more so, sadistic way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. So let me ask you this question. And we'll probably end up making this question our question of the week for our super friends. Is the Joker the best comic book villain? Yes. Tell me why. Why do you, why do you think so? Because he is the epitome of the hero he's fighting. And that's so rare to see in comic books. Like, when you think of iconic heroes and villains and people who could be the foils to the, the to each other, people first person that comes up is the Joker, Lex Luthor, and maybe the Green Goblin for Spider-Man or Dr. Octopus. Right. And when you yeah. kind of look at those those guys, Lex Luthor, in a fight, he's not taking Superman. No, it's it's like it's not like something that you can like. Okay, Lex Luthor doesn't have a chance unless he does a whole bunch of things. He's not taking Superman in a fight. No, yeah, never. Green but he Goblin, outsmart, but he can, he can outsmart, outsmart Superman. He can yeah. outsmart Superman. Green Goblin has a, a decent chance of beating Spider Man, but. Nine times a day, he's not going to beat Spider-Man. Right. The interesting thing about the Joker that I've always found fascinating is that he doesn't have to beat Batman to win. Yep. And that's more dangerous than anything else. I think you hit it right there on the head. The Joker doesn't have to beat Batman to win. That's yes. what makes him scary good as a villain. Uh, I I think I agree with you, man. Like, if, if I'm saying villains, like... In comics, it's definitely Joker number one, probably Lex Luthor number two. Yes. I mean, it just, DC has some really good villains. Uh, Not that Marvel doesn't, because Marvel does, but just in my book, Joker's number one, and then Lex Luthor's number two. So this is going to be my question of the week for the Super Friends. Is Joker the best comic book villain? And if the answer you say is no, who is, in your opinion, the best comic book villain? And you can get us at all of our normal places. I want to hear these answers. So get us on on the email, fortofnerd at gmail.com, Facebook, facebook.com slash fortofnerd, Twitter at fortofnerd. Uh, you can call in the voicemail number, 801-477-7687. And we're also on Instagram now, fortofnerd. Check out, the gram. Check out that gram, man. I'm, man, we're getting some traction on Instagram lately. I've never really kind of gotten into it, but hey, it's, it's doing well. We're getting some... Uh, some attraction there. So uh, you can get us there as well. Delvin, it's been a pleasure having you on. I've wanted to do this for a little while now, and I definitely wanted to bring you on to talk about the Joker and this trailer and the character. Where can all the super friends find you if they are clueless and they don't already know? How can they get a hold of you? Where are you at? Where can they find the Delvin Cox experience? On Twitter at Delvin underscore Cox. And if you want us to the Delvin Cox experience, it's literally everywhere you get podcasts at iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, <laughs> YouTube, Stitcher, YouTube, Stitcher, 
carrier pigeon probably <laughs> <laughs> right and then uh you said you're also on the skyward cast right skyward cast with joey craig and that's yep. everywhere as well and i'm also um this happened recently i want to say a month ago i'm like the third host of games you don't play really yes i didn't know that that's awesome yeah so it's me chalfie and sean now nice nice i have to I have to go give a listen i have like this rotating kind of list and i kind of like get away from some and then like a few months go by and I come back and then I catch up on a whole bunch of them. So yeah, that's awesome. That's how I do it too. Pretty soon yeah. I'll probably be hosting the Joe Rogan podcast too. <laughs> I keep picking <laughs> right. up all these podcasts. Mark Marin starring Delvin Cox. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right, Delvin. Well, man, I appreciate you coming in tonight and, uh, and hanging with us here in the fortress of nerditude. And, uh, from all of us here to all of you out there, wherever you may be, may the force be with you. Always.